adorable? Yeah. Oh, with their little suits, that's so great. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Reverend Carol Huntley. For those of you who are new or new-ish, I'm very glad to be with you this morning. And um, let me just get all my gizmos ready here. You are at the Golden Gate Center for Spiritual Living, where our vision is awakening personal transformation, and our mission is teaching tools for positive change. That is what, why we're here and what we're doing here. And I have someone's article of clothing on my space. <laughs> uh, so I'm just going to put that right there. All righty then. Our theme for this entire year is Your Joyous Life, and we're working um, to expand that feeling of joy and happiness no matter where you are right now. At the end of today, I, it is my goal that you are happier, and at the end of next week, it's my goal that you're happier still. That's what I'm working on, and so does that, is that okay for you all? It, would that be all right? Okay, good. So what we're doing is we're combining spiritual principles along with some practices that enable us to um, inhabit our natural state. And one aspect of our natural state is absolute joy. We have a theme each month, and our theme this month is See the Face of God in Others, which I love this one because, you know, sometimes we, we it's hard for us to see the face of God in somebody that's very different from us but they have no problem. So uh, that's just one of our lessons is to practice, practice, practice seeing the face of God because we are all equally precious to the creator. And our goal this month is to deepen friendships. So I love it when I see uh, pictures of friends on Facebook from the center, and I did this week, so that was an answer to prayer that people, in fact, there were like, four or five beautiful women that were out with Ed Budkowski. So, that, and so, of course, he had to post that on Facebook. That's great. So um, my talk today is being friends with all aspects of God. Is, isn't that precious? <clears throat> so the goal is friendship, and, and you might uh, think, gosh, being friendly with God, that the... the author of the entire universe, how does that work? So other words that I think of when I think of friendly are approachable, comfortable, and familiar. Because our teaching is that God is not only to the furthest reaches of the universe and, and transcendent, but the infinite presence is also deeply within and very, very personal. And so there is an aspect to our spiritual practice that we want to get really up close and personal with this author of the universe so that our lives can work the way they were created to work. So if you have, if you came from another spiritual tradition, and if you already have practices that you love, that you do, I want you to keep doing them. And what I'm going to do today is to talk about how to develop a comfortable, workable, and familiar relationship with the infinite presence um, from our tradition, from science of mind. So would that be okay with you? Yes. All right, great. So um, there are two main aspects to God or the infinite presence. And I love this image because one of them is love and one of them is law. So when we think about love and law, like any words that go with God, the words themselves are limiting. But I'm going to do my very best at my level of consciousness this morning to illuminate love and law for you, so that, and with you, and with me, so that we all can expand our familiarity, our comfort, and our closeness with the infinite presence. So as always, we have an altar that supports this wonderful topic, or every wonderful topic, every wonderful altar. And this is a, a Kathy Fowler altar. And Kathy writes me a little description and sends it to me by email, which is absolutely so perfect. So I told her that today the talk was about love and law. So this is what she says. The three angels form a triangle of balance and stability. 
The color blue represents serenity and spirituality. The Virgin Mary is clothed in blue. There are two Marys on the altar. One is from the cathedral in Lucca, Italy, and the other is from the house of the Virgin Mary in Ephesus, Turkey. I think she just got back from there. <laughs> the holy water is also from her house. In both representations, she is holding baby Jesus. These are clear symbols of love. Kuan Yin, from an entirely different tradition, of course, reminds us to have compassion for ourselves as well as others. The orchids provide love and beauty. The glass hearts shower us with transformative love. So I love that um, Kathy Fowler does combine so many different traditions like we do in our teachings because if something is true one place, it's true all places. So thank you, Kathy. Let's give the... Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So when we think of love and law, the first thing that I want to remind you to do is think as big as possible. So love is really more than affection. But it's related because when we say that we love something, we love pasta, we love garlic, we love Hawaii, we love our children, we love our pets, it's, it's a, a warm feeling in our heart of affection, and that doesn't come from any place else but God. So there is a part of that, that in infinite affection, uh, God relates to us. But um, it's so much more than that. So to kind of get in that feeling, if you could remember a time when you felt absolutely loved. You felt, or, or there was love surrounding you. You were in a beautiful place or with someone you loved. And then you take that feeling and you double it. And then you multiply it by 10. And then you multiply it by 100. And you get as, it, you know, if you really do this, if you sit in meditation and feel love around you and then multiply it, multiply it, multiply it, you get kind of this drunk feeling. And, and it, or kind of like you're, I get uh, like I, I'm underwater and it's thick, you know, the love is thick around me. And actually, all of those Sufi poets, Hafez and Rumi, talk about this drunkenness of love that happens when we contemplate how much God loves us. So if you think that all sacred art and poetry and music is um, a, a attempt to communicate God's love. Now, in Science of Mind, the definition, I think, is, is wanting, but still it illuminates an aspect of God's love. And so the definition of love in Science of Mind is the self-givingness of God. So what that means is that every single thing that is created is created out of the infinite one, and every single thing that is created is given to us. That's pretty loving. So every single thing that you could imagine already exists, and it already has been given to you. So to illuminate the love of God in one of the aspects of, from our founder, Dr. Ernest Holmes, there's a, a wonderful meditation in the back of the textbook where he writes, so just open everything so that you can get the sense and the feeling of this because love happens in our feeling state. Oh, love divine within me, I am overpowered by thy presence. I am speechless. For words cannot utter the things that thou hast revealed to me. Why dost thou love me so? And why clasp me so close to thy eternal heart? O blessed presence, I know, for thou hast claimed me as thine own. I shall never more walk apart from thee. The love of God is within thee. And we'll have some more examples of that. But let's talk about law for a moment, and I'll get back to love. Law is the way things come into being. It is, in the Bible, when it says the word is made flesh, that's what we're talking about. When we talk about law, it's a short version of 
the term the creative law or the law of creation. And it's how things and experiences get created. And the way they get created is from thought and feeling into that creative milieu of how things get made, and then they get made. You know, that's it. It's, it's, uh, it's thought, and then the law takes it, and then it makes it. Takes it, makes it. That's it. Um, and, and so when you think about thought being the beginning of the creative process, we realize that we can't create healing out of vengeance. It has to be similar. We can create peace from peace, but we can't create peace from violence. So if you want a quality in your life, you have to be that first. That's just the way it is. You can't ask for it and not be it. That's one of the things that makes this the good news philosophy and also the very challenging philosophy to internalize. So we get corresponding experiences from the words or the beliefs that we hold and that we express. Here is something from the wonderful Irish mystic John O'Donohue. Each day, our tribe of language holds what we call the world together. Yet the uttering of the word reveals how each of us relentlessly creates. Everyone is an artist. Each person brings sound out of silence and coaxes the invisible to become visible. So these two aspects of the infinite, as we understand them, form our experience of life and being friendly and comfortable and uh, user-friendly which each, with each of these aspects of God is what we want to accomplish. And although I'm going to talk about it today, it's something that we do every single day. The idea is that we get familiar enough with God, just like a friend, that there's no surprises anymore. Like if you, I mean like no bad surprises. Um, so the friends that you love, you pretty much know them. You pretty much know what is in their character and not in their character. So, it, for example, uh, once we get familiar and comfy with God, we won't have that experience of saying, oh, that's how love works. You know, I, I had hateful thoughts and feelings, and I'm getting them back. You know, that, that's how love works. Yeah. So we don't have surprises like that. All right, so you ready to get deeper into this? Okay, yeah, that's what I like, yeah. All right, the love of God. <sighs> First of all, I've got some concepts here and stories for you about the love of God. The love of God means that we are all connected. We are all one with each other and one with God. We are never alone, we are never cut off, we're never hung out to dry. If we feel that we are alone, it's not God that has gone away. That's that whole story of the... Um, the prodigal son. The prodigal son left. And instantly, when the prodigal son said, oh, I could go to my father's house, then everything shifted because the father's house is always, always available to us. And that's the words from the New Testament. But in metaphysics, it's just that sense of belonging, that sense of being connected, that sense of I'm never alone. Even if I don't have my peeps around me, I have my God around me. And all of that is, is there forever and ever and ever. Um, so the uh, prodigal son is from the New Testament. And here is something from the Psalms in the Old Testament that's so so, so beautiful. Ah, this is Psalm 139. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If my, I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. So forever and ever and ever, we have been trying to put this into words, what it is that it means when we are connected to God and immersed, surrounded by, imbued with God's love. 
Next, it means that we are provided. You know, love means everything is always given over and over and over and over. It's all given all the time. And so whatever we need is available to us. Whatever we want is available to us. Whatever we have a notion of is available to us. What I'm going to read to you right now is a little bit from Margaret Wheatley. Now, Margaret Wheatley is a biologist and a systems theorist. She doesn't really talk about God too much, but as I said, when something works, when something is true, it appears in every wisdom tradition. So this is the wisdom tradition of biology and systems theory within biology. So this is what Meg Wheatley says. This world of wild exploration is one which tinkers itself into existence. Life seeks solutions, tends towards support and stability, generates systems that sustain diverse individuals. But how it gets there violates all of our rules of good process. Life seeks order in a disorderly way, mess upon mess, until something workable emerges. Now for me, I absolutely love that Meg Wheatley talks about messes and how messes get us where we want to go. Because you, know, you look at some of the surfaces in my house right now, and God is all over there <laughs> with all kinds of messes tinkering itself into order. So this concluding uh, thought is, all this messy playfulness creates relationships that make available more, more expressions, more variety, more stability, more support. So that is what, that's what we get. More and more and more of what we need. We are provided all the time. Next, precious. You are precious. You are adored. You are tenderly loved by the Infinite One. Every single tradition has love stories of God to its people and 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 that that drunken state, that drunken state. So I have a Hafez short, short poem for you about love. And this comes from a wonderful book called The Subject Tonight is Love. And this is a little poem called The Day Sky. Let us be like two falling stars in the day sky. Let no one know of our sublime beauty as we hold hands with God and burn into a sacred existence that defies, that surpasses every description of ecstasy and love. Now that's pretty hot, don't you think? <laughs> I, that is pretty, pretty hot. So, you are adored. And really, all you have to do is sit and say, show me, share with me, let me know that I'm loved. No matter if you were not well loved by humans, you may be, you can be, you are well loved by God. And so the next quality of love is safety. You are as safe as a toad in God's pocket, as my Aunt Helen used to say. And so I know this begs that uh, question, well, what about um, accidents and crazy people and war and disease? Well, you are eternal. You are connected, provided, and precious forever, forever and ever and ever and ever, longer than this life, before this life, and after this life. And you know, every single one of us has a way that we're going to get out of this life. Our ticket is going to be, you know, stamped or punched, and we are going to be done here. We're going to be done. And so I want to just suggest that safety has really nothing to do with death. Nothing. Because you know what? Every single one of us, is going to go through that doorway of death well and happy and safe. And 
on the other side. So no matter what happens to you, and something happens to all of us, you are safe in God, only going from here in God to somewhere else in God. Okay, let's take a big breath on that one, you know, when we say the D word, it's scary sometimes, but, you know, it's only because we've been taught that, and, and I'm trying to teach us something different, telling myself the same thing. Next, you are worthy. It doesn't matter what you've done, what you've said, where you've been, wh the meanness that you've done, the hurt you've caused, nope, nothing. You are worthy of God's love. No matter what. Franz Kafka said something really great. You do not need to leave your room. Remain sitting at your table and listen. You don't need to listen. Simply wait. Don't even wait. Be quite still and solitary. And the world will freely offer itself to you to be unmasked. It has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. That's God's world, rolling in ecstasy at your feet because you are worthy. And so to finish up the love part, you are unrepeatably miraculous. You are one of a kind. You are perfect, whole, complete, unique, special. The mold was broken. There's nobody like you. Every part of you is a miracle. When you think about your bodily processes, when your thought processes, your dreams, your skills, your gifts, everybody is different. There's nobody like you. And, and you have these gifts to give that are unique that the world is calling forth because God loves you and God gave them to you to give again. That's the whole thing. You come into this world to learn and to give. There you go. And to know that you are connected, provided, precious, safe, worthy, and miraculous. Okay, now, yeah, this is what we're working for. And yet there is one thing that you can do that turns it all off. Okay? This is what you don't want to do. And I'm going to, there's, there's one for love and one for law. This is what you don't want to do refrain from yes but like oh well yes but you don't know about my childhood oh yes but you don't know what I did then oh yes but you know I came from you know a mixed home of Catholicism and Judaism and uh, I'm confused and so you can all of these gifts of love if you say well yes but they're still there. They're still pounding. Oh, my God. What a difficult way to live. Refusing these gifts every minute of your life because of this stupid <laughs> thought that's based on a lie. No more. Those of you here today and those of you listening, no more yes buts, okay? Okay. Let's say, say yes, yes, yes. Okay, no more yes buts. All right, then you can have all the goodies. Okay, uh, going quickly through the law of God. All right, by our consciousness, we mold our lives. Our consciousness are our thoughts, our attitudes, our expectations, our felt state, and what we sort for. That's part of our consciousness. Do I sort for problems? Do I sort for who's, who's you know, maybe better than me? Who's, who, do I compare? Do I, how do I sort the world? We all sort the world because there's more stimulus coming at us than we can ever process. And so we notice things. Do we notice the problems or do we notice the blessings? That is part of consciousness. And what we put out, we get back. So first of all, using the law, we are all capable. Not only are we capable, we are working the law because the law doesn't turn off. The law does not say, oh, this poor person who does not understand what they're saying, I'm going to back off. No. The law is like gravity. It just says, okay, 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 you get it. Yes, a big yes, you get that. Yes, this thing that you don't want, that you accept, yes, you get that. So um, 
we are capable of changing our mind. Has anyone ever changed their mind about anything? Yeah, you know that you're capable of changing your mind, and when you change your mind, then the law takes the changed mind and makes you a changed life. So I want to tell you something really, really important about working with a practitioner. Because a practitioner, when you get a prayer at the end of service from a practitioner, or when you work with a practitioner, the practitioner knows how to change their mind. They change their own mind about you. They, you tell them what you're lacking, what you want, what your dream is, what your expectation is, what you want shifted in your life, and the practitioner knows how to say, not only is this possible, but God has already given it, and so I accept in my mind that this is done for this person. Now, your job is to catch the consciousness of the practitioner. The practitioner is not doing a spell on you that lasts for 24 hours. And then you have to come back and get the same prayer again. And then that prayer works for 24 hours. Then you come back and get the same prayer again. That is, it will change when you change. So I adore and love every single one of you, but when you come to this table and ask for the same prayer week after week after week after week, it is your consciousness that's saying, I don't believe in my capacity. And then you know what the law says? Yes. Yes, the change has to come in you, and then your life changes. So maybe your next prayer should be, help me to believe. Help me to believe that I can do this, that this prayer is answered, that I am capable of changing my mind. Whew. You're powerful. You are powerful to work with the law. You can accomplish, you can remain joyful and peaceful in the midst of turmoil. You are absolutely unlimited, and the way that you prove you're powerful to yourself is that you take classes and you apply the principles. You apply the principles, and then you get little changes. You get little changes, like you find parking places. We all start with parking places. And then you realize that the law works on everything, and the law does not know you large or small. It doesn't care whether it makes you a parking place or a whole new career. It doesn't care. All it does is say yes. Working with the law is easy because you are wise. Why are you wise? Because your mind is the mind of God. And working with the mind of God, you are catching divine ideas that are useful for you. That's how wisdom works. And so you sit in your spiritual practice and you say, what is mine to do? Now sometimes, I think pretty often, when we ask, what is mine to do, what comes to us is something that we thought, mm, ugh, please, no. That is not my, I don't know how, I don't have enough skill, I don't, whatever. But if you sit and the answer keeps coming to you, that is yours to do, guess what? With all that is already given to you because you are the beloved of God, you can do it, and that's how we change, grow, and transform, is by stepping into the unknown and saying yes. Okay, stepping into the unknown again and saying yes. And when we do that, it makes us really brave. That's another thing that we do when we work with the law. It takes courage to actually change. Growth, transformation, and experiencing our deepest desires takes real guts. And you can't expect things to change if you don't change. It does not, we are not in a system where the world changes around you just because you want it to, but you can remain the same. <laughs> That's not where we live. Maybe the next time you'll, you know, you can create a place like that for you, but no. The world doesn't change around you unless you change, and then, of course, it changes. Next, we work with the law by accepting first where we are and then where we're going. If you, if you say 411, that's a lot, 411 times, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich, and there's something within you that goes, liar, liar, and you don't, you don't take care of that inner belief, 
you will not change and, and become prosperous and abundant. Knowing where you are and what your, the atmosphere of your thoughts are is the, first, is the first place you have to go in order to change. And then, you know, that Borg comment, any Star Trek-y people here, um, resistance is futile. You have to start where you are. And then finally, what works us when we're working with the law is that we become humble. As, as much as we kind of want to take credit for all the good stuff that happens to us, it's not us that does it. It is us that makes the change inside, but it is the Father within who actually does the work. It's the Father within who makes the, the changes happen, who works the law. So just like in, in working with the love, um, when there, there was something that can kind of make this all go haywire, there's something that can make the law go haywire for you, and that is um, if, if you are an observer, if you just say, oh, well, I'll just wait and see. I'll just watch how this happens for other people. The law still works for you because, remember, we can't turn off the law. But the way the law works is that it gives you the average of the racial consciousness around you and basically the atmosphere of your family you were born with. Because you inherit the consciousness, just like you inherit blue eyes and blonde hair, you inherit the consciousness of the family that you were born into. And so if you don't work with the law to change, you're going to just stay where you were when you were one. And as happy as our childhood may or may not have been, there's other things for us to do. I mean, we, we have other things to do this life. So, in conclusion about all this, um, yesterday was the ministerial graduation for uh, three ministers in the Bay Area who finished their uh, studies with um, the Holmes Institute. Uh, there was one from the Oakland Church, one from the Napa Church, and one from the Santa Rosa Church. And we're going to have a graduate next year, by the way. Scott, Scott's going to graduate next year, so it'll be this time next year will be big party time. But when I was at that graduation, I remembered when I graduated. Um, it was in um, 1989, and, um, and I started right away in, in a church in San Francisco. And I remember going to my first minister's meeting when I had been in the pulpit for six weeks in a row. And I was there with all of these experienced ministers. And when we introduced ourselves and shared, I immediately broke into sobs because I had expressed everything I knew in my first six weeks. <laughs> I had nothing more to say. So what this means is this talk about love and law I must have given 20 times over the years. This is our teaching. This is it. Love and law, this is it. You don't get advanced training, really. You work with the love, and you work with the law, and I work with the love, and I work with the law, and this is my level of consciousness that I have shared with you today about the love and the law, and we all work with this growing, 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 growing together. And hopefully when I give an, the next talk about love and law, it'll be at a, at a higher, more rarefied level with words that help us all understand better. But this is what it is today, and this is all it is. Love and law. So we are in this together. We are in this together. Spreading the love of God and using the law of God. And I am very happy.
happy. I could not be happier with any other group in the world. Blessed be. And so, for the going deeper, this is what we're headed for. My magnificence and the goodness of my life is because I am one with my indwelling source. Simple and profound. I ask you now to turn within. And for this inner work, see if you can visualize the working of the love and the law around you. With your eyes closed, draw upon any special effect you have seen in any movie or anything that you can imagine yourself and feel the sizzling at the subatomic level all around you. Feel the rays of love that are showered upon you. Imagine that time of feeling absolutely adored and try multiplying it by 10. Imagine that you are viewing yourself as God sees you. Oh, so adored. Perfect, whole, and complete, an unrepeatable miracle. And even though we don't want to anthropomorphize and make God into a person, I can imagine in that infinite way, the infinite one thinking, oh, I did a really good job on this one. They are so precious, so wonderful, so amazing. I want this one to see through my eyes. I want this one to feel through my heart. I want this one to know how powerful they are. I want this one to use the gifts I have given. I want this one to make a difference in this world. I want this one to take all of those gifts and give them back again so that when I bring this one home, they are completely used up so that I can replenish them again for their eternal, never-ending journey in me as I 